It was really great to see so many fan arts, so many letters, so many fiction, yeah. um, cosplays, cosplays. The reactions were fantastic, way be beyond our previous expectations. It was impossible to expect a, a huge community like this and so passionate fans yeah, and it, it, it's great. So. <laughs> Thank you. you yeah. <laughs> we started the project by making the game we wanted to make for ourselves, but at the end it's really making a game for the players because it's no, that's what's important. Uh, so welcome to the dev commentary of Life is Strange. We're really happy to, to be there and talk about the game. Uh, thank you for watching. Thanks. I'm Raoul Barbet, one of the co-game directors of the game. And I'm Michel Kaur, the other co-game director of the game. We, we are two game directors working on, the, on one project, so it's it really interesting to, to work that way. Uh, it can be hard sometimes, but I think it's... It's a really interesting creative process because we can challenge each other on a lot of yeah. aspects and, and find out always the better solution for what's best for yeah. the game. If only Michel or Raoul was directing the game, the game would have been really different. They, they both know uh, how to make a game, like they, they're not stuck in their uh, field of expertise. They know a lot of things about each department and they had this direct contact with the teams. I'm more from the audiovisual and uh, movie uh, scene, so I, I was in charge of all the, the cameras with the, the camera team. I work a lot with the sound design team also, with the music. And uh, myself, um, since I'm from an illustration background, I was my specialties were more on the art direction. and. Uh, Later, um, for this game, I'm starting to work way more with the narrative team and, and the voice recording sessions. It was, it was cool because they, had, uh, they have the similar vision uh, for the game, so we didn't have a yes from one and a no from the other. And actually, Michelle and Howell are in the game when you think about it because so there are two game directors, so we have a contraction which, which is Michelle. But uh, there is, if you put it the other way around, it's Raoul and Michel, so it's Rachel. I'm pretty sure they did it on purpose. The idea behind the game was to, because we have both of us worked on Remember Me, and uh, there were some sequences in this game called uh, Memory Remixes, and uh, one of the founders, uh, Hervé Bonin, uh, uh, asked this small core team to, to, to think about a game with this kind of mechanism. Very quickly he came uh, the episodic adventure game because we wanted really to, to do something like that. There is really a lot of good ways to, new ways to, interactive ways to tell stories. On an episodic format you have to make a lot of choice uh, for episode one because you won't be able to change after. Uh, a lot of assets have to be there in episode one. Yeah. So the menu is one of uh, those assets. It was interesting because there was a lot of variations. We, we did a lot of tries of what we wanted to show in this menu. Uh, the idea is, was really to basically show the most important locations of the game. So we can, we can see the, the Blackwell Academy on, on, on the top right. We can see the lighthouse. We can see the, the, the town of Arcadia Bay. We were really trying to give a sense of location and just showing like the, the game the game world with the menu. We really wanted to to make the player feel that all areas are connected and the menu is a great way to do that. One of the main uh, importance for us uh, for the game was to have a, a peaceful game with this sense of you can take your time and we, we wanted to reflect that from the menu so we, we worked on those small wind effects and the leaves that are going around and the, the nice and soft music. It was just when you start the game you should feel quite um, at peace and com comfortable. And, and even uh, when, when the menu evolves in each episode, there is sm so some small details that are changing in, in for the menu for episode four, you have the, the, the beach whaled. That's this kind of details we wanted to to just add with the variations of the menu. The game takes place in, in Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, in the United States. When I went back there in, on, on, on vacations, I've, I've seen a lot of places that really looks like what we did in the game. So I guess we... It was a really big job of references to be sure that everything was correct, uh, but it, it's also something that's really exciting about making a game, that you have to, to look at everything and to reproduce reality, and with, of course, our, our own lens and, and, and stylizations, but uh, we really wanted this to feel like being in Oregon. Sometimes people ask us if we choose to have a game in the United States for marketing, for selling the game. We, we knew that we were fans of 
like TV shows like Twin Peaks or X-Files. They have those, those trees and the Pacific Northwest feeling. Uh, I think they are a great example of a, a small community uh, thinking that they, everybody knows each other and everybody is happy, but when you put something uh, inside this community, uh, it could be something supernatural. Uh, you, you discover uh, a lot more. And it's really a way to, to shift things around and to bring chaos and interesting variations on the, on the characters. And at the, in the end, Life is Strange is really a, a, a game and a story about the characters, about their lives. It's not a story about the sci-fi elements. The sci-fi elements are just for, uh, for us. They were just here to make, make things interesting. Okay, so let's let's play the game and yeah, let's play Life is Strange. Yeah. So this is the very beginning of the game. Uh, I think this is one of the very difficult seconds of the beginning of the production because, as you yeah, this is the first time the player will see what the game looks like and will be inside the story. Uh, so we got a lot of discussion about this one and a lot of discussion about the shots. Uh, oh, we are going to present uh, Max character. Uh, the important, as this is a video game, is the player to know where he has to go and the objective of, the, of, the, of each scene. This scene is a link to the end of the game, of course, and it's also to, to close the loop and uh, begin with this scene. And when you know the end of the game, was something we really wanted to have. So we can see all the FX and we've got one FX artist very talented, Thomas. Uh, here you can see a lot yeah, of his work, uh, the all the particles, the tornado. We, we took a lot of time to work on this yeah. tornado because when you're working on an episodic game, it's it's important to still hook the player from episode one. So that's 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 the kind of discussion we had we had about the reason to when should we put something that has a bit more impact and that feels something that shows the player that there is something bigger. Uh, so this introduction was was a bit like that. We wanted in, in Life is Strange the player to always know what Max is knowing and. To to, to just be with her. At this moment, Max doesn't know where she is and the player doesn't know it either. Whoa. We're back to, to the high school, and which is one of the most important settings of the game, of course, the high school setting and the Blackwell Academy. High school is something where the player will feel comfortable because he knows it, but the transition from the cliff to there is the twist of being, having something really different and that should hook the player to say, oh, it's not just a teen story, it's, there is more to it. And then, of course, we can go much more, much over than that and twist it and change the characters. But it was an interesting starting point uh, creatively. This kind of uh, introduction is really important because in one uh, sequence with some shots you have to discover all the different characters, the main ones, so you will see of course Jefferson, Kate and Victoria. And it was quite hard to decide between not showing too much, to not break the idea of the game, to not be too big before, uh, compared to what the game would be would be would be after there is a lot of themes of big big ideas on, on, on the game and of course photography is one of, one of it because photography is still a way to to look back to the past it's linked to the theme of rewind and time manipulation and nostalgia and that's one of the reasons why Max came back to Arcadia Bay to attend this photography class I think for the player to be like Max uh, back in this town when she, she don't know everyone, but you, you've got to respect the schedule. It's really, as a player, something great uh, to, to discover. Also, the, the lighting was really important in this scene to, to break the, the cliff uh, ambience by this uh, sunny atmosphere and all this light coming from the windows. And maybe we, we decided to, to, to have a, pr a private high school rather than just a regular high school for, of course, for the photography course. But it was also to be able to have less students because we wanted the story to be a bit more intimate. We didn't want it to be like a, this huge high school with so many students. But based on what the player is doing, you can really learn more about them and see that they're actually not just the stereotype and the, the archetype. You, you would think they are 
this is still a perfect example of how episodic is hard <laughs> because if yeah. you look closely at this poster there is a mistake on it it says that the, the exhibition takes place in the De Jong Museum of Art yeah, when actually it. it's not like, it's not that in episode 5 it's the Zeitgeist Gallery we have a really great community <laughs> yeah. so thank, you, thank you guys uh, and people found out this mistake and yes it is a mistake it's uh, when in episode 5 we found out that we couldn't couldn't be a museum it was too too big so it has to be mm. an art gallery so we changed the name and yes, there is a mistake like this in episode how cute I looked yet. I was about to. Welcome to the cute. real world. We really yeah. wanted to then, to have this I feeling of being cute. part of a wall high school. So it means a lot of people. It means bullying. It <laughs> means uh, uh, difficulties when you're a teenager in this kind of world. Uh, uh, showing the different cliques and different kind of, 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 uh, of teenager. I think a lot of players love this introduction. The use of music here is really important. Is as Max feels insecure in this atmosphere, uh, we wanted her to isolate. And the music is a, a great way of isolate yourself when you just want to be on your own and. So since the beginning of the game, we were working uh, with uh, license tracks, license music. We, we test when we were testing on prototypes and synths. We put some license tracks from artists we love, and Sin Matters was one of them. And when we ask uh, Jonathan Morali, who is the lead uh, of Sin Matters, if it's possible to use his music, uh, he's, he's a gamer, so it was really happy to have this new experience. And for us, it, yeah, it's just incredible to work with him and this quite of uh, editing is really really difficult to do because you have to to choose the important uh, moment in a song and to choose the, the right images because our writer Jean-Luc uh, has written many many scenes built around music the, the edit is based is uh, based on the music it's not uh, the other way the music is really important in the game it, it explains a lot about the characters uh, because the choice of the music, the choice of the artist means a lot. For example, Chloe won't listen to the same artist as Max. For the anecdote, for this uh, guitar part, we asked the lead uh, singer of uh, Sin Matters to, to take his guitar and to play on top of uh, Gonzalez's song in a clumsy way to be sure that it would be like Max playing guitar. Okay, so the objective of this scene was to go into the bathroom. I think you can hear, hear the great uh, sound work. Uh, Sebastian, the audio lead, uh, has worked a lot on this kind of effects. When you, you take out your earplug, uh, you, you can hear more the, the ambience. And this kind of art uh, is done by uh, our main concept artist. Uh, we got like three four concept artists working yeah. on the game uh, with Edouard, uh, Edouard who has made a lot of artwork he was the one uh, concept artist. artist. So basically in the beginning we do a lot of uh, documentation, like we do a lot of research from all those pictures we can find on the internet, every room, every character needs to tell you a story, what they, who they are, what they do. And just for following the scene, even for the for the for the mood when it's still the rhythm of the game. So we wanted this scene in the bathroom to have a really cold and harsher and more contrasty lighting, be, to 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 be different from the the the, 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 the soft and, and warm lighting from from the from the art class before. Seeing this scene, uh, there was here one of the mistakes we have done uh, with the game. Uh, for example, when Max is a uh, Tearing oh, yeah. <laughs> apart uh, Polaroid. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you have tried to tear apart a Polaroid, but it's quite impossible. Yeah, you can. We, we, uh, we tried it. We can't. You can't do it. It's so, too too strong. It's so plastic it's and it's of, impossible uh, to tear it like she does. But of course, there is a lot of symbolic uh, behind this, and uh, so we decided to keep it, uh, even if it's yeah. non-realistic. Yeah, maybe it's a bad. Uh, and bad Polaroid uh, quality and, and we can do it. So uh, You can see the butterfly coming in from the window. There's a lot of uh, symbol behind this. Uh, the bu butterfly, of course, with all the butterfly effects thing and the fact that uh, Chloe has got uh, some butterflies in her tattoo. And 
the, the color of her hair based yeah, on the color of the butterfly. Really something we wanted to hear the blue butterfly is really, really important. And of course, at the end of the game, it's much more important. One of the fans' favorite and of course, a character we really love, Chloe. She's a... She's one of the most important characters because at the end, the choice is about her. It was really important to create this character the best way possible so the player would l learn to care more and more about her. But we, want, we really wanted her to be not that nice at the beginning, so when she's evolving during the, the different episodes uh, and she's getting nicer to Max, people would care, care even more about her because she changed and she likes the fact that she, she, she changed. Uh, if she was the nicest person from the beginning, it wouldn't be, I think, as effective that her uh, going uh, forward and, and changing uh, toward Max. Yeah. Some, sometimes uh, some players uh, hated uh, Chloe for the, <laughs> during the first episode, and I think it's not a, a bad thing, because uh, you can yeah, dislike a lot of, of things about her personality. Uh, and after an episode three, and of course at the beginning of episode four, there is really something uh, more to this character and uh, I think it's like having a in, with a, in a real life with a friend you, there is always some things you, you don't like and the relation between Max and Chloe talk about that and I think it's really interesting to to see how the player will learn to, to like more and more Chloe and Sorry. I think it was one of the biggest challenge of the of, of the of the writing process to because we have five episodes we have a, a limited amount of time and we need to find the good the good beats and the, the good pacing to make those characters e evolve. It's a really intimate story and it's mostly just centered on um, just emotional moments. All of the major choices that you make in the game are emotional. The heart of it is the relationship between Max and Chloe. It gets really dark and things get really hard for Chloe and really emo emotional. In the game one of our goal was also to be able to talk about real life issues about some social themes and difficult themes that um, that can be experienced in real life. Um, I mean, it's different to other games where there are bigger issues like uh, situations of life or death or war or stuff like that. And in, in this game, we wanted really to, to focus on more human issues on, on a smaller level. The mood of the game and the themes uh, of the game, it's the themes uh, that we tackle in the game are not something that you that you see often in other games. We try to be mature about it. We, we, we try not to force it onto players and we try not to be too brutal about it. We, we have issues like uh, domestic violence, family issues. So we talk about drugs, alcoholism, uh, depression. It's really part of a, of a reality and I think it, it was really important for us to not avoid that. And I think it's a, a great uh, video game is also a great media to talk about that because as a player, you will be involved uh, maybe more than mm. just looking at a, a movie or reading a book. You will be really part an actor of this experience. Yeah. We are not sure that uh, Square Enix, the publisher, will uh, will approve all the the scenes, the intense scenes we have, and how we deal with them. And really early in the discussions we were relieved to, to, to see that they didn't want to change anything. They just wanted to make sure that we deal properly with the scenes or themes and this is exactly what was uh, what were our intentions. So it's again a, a key scene uh, for episode one. It's the first time uh, you see Nathan and Chloe. First scene with the character is really really important. We got a lot of, inf of information to, to give to the player. And we needed to show that Nathan was quite a, a troubled troubled child, a teenager, I mean. Uh, so this is him talking to himself at the beginning. We, we, we had to fine tune and to find the, the good words to use. Then we see Chloe for the first time. We have to show what's, what's her character. So she's direct and, and, and a bit uh, pushy to Nathan. Um, we need still to understand what's what's happening. So they are talking about money, about drugs. We we had to give to find the right hints to give to explain to explain things. So so we don't want to lose the player. Got us a pump.
punk ass who begs like a little girl and talks to himself. You don't know who the fuck I am or who you're messing around with. Where'd you get that? What are you doing? Come on, put that thing down. Don't ever tell me what to do. I'm so sick of people trying to control me. You are going to get in hella more trouble for this than drugs. This scene, this is the starting point of Max discovering that she has this weird power because basically this adrenaline rush and throwing, looking at Chloe getting shot, that's how she, she can trigger that for the first time and she don't know really why, but that's this, the, the seriousness of the situation, the then, then you'll go back, go back in, in the art class. <laughs> so we really tried on this scene to show the déjà vu feeling, so the editing and the shots was, were there to, 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 to give this weird feeling to the player that, okay, I'm living that again and again, looking at the different moments that the player sh saw the first time in this scene. So yeah, for the editing in this uh, sequence, we wanted to keep the same elements, uh, but not necessarily the same shots. You can see that uh, first three shots are the same, I think, and the, after we begin to change a little the point of view. So you understand that there are the same uh, events going on, but just seeing from a different point of view. And I think to be perfectly honest, we, we don't have a good um, explanation for why she's going back <laughs> to the art class because we needed it I've for... I've got one, but I will never tell you. I don't think it's a mistake yeah. because we also need it to explain to the player so the player can learn how things are, wor are working mm -hmm. and it's quite hard to do. So we, we took this freedom to have Max go back to the art class, which even if it's a bit contradictory with how our power works after that. We are using this to explore more of Max's personality, of the characters, and um, because that's the way we created the, char we created the character. Max, as we, 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 we've seen that with our, what she's thinking, she has a lot of insecurity, she has issues to go forward in, in, in her life, to, to take decisions. And now she has, she has this ability to not going forward, but going even backward. So it's an interesting storytelling device to, to question uh, with our character and with the player, of course, to question uh, choice and consequences, to question fate, to question really interesting issues. I think Max would never have changed uh, as much as here in our story without uh, this power and without this sci-fi element. So it puts the, the player in a very interesting position because she will ask himself the while he's doing some interaction, he can undo the interaction and try something else. But also Max, by doing this, will ask herself, uh, am I doing the right uh, decision? Am I, is it the, the, the good choice or not? So we deconstruct the mechanism of uh, adventure, classic adventure game just by adding this power on the fact that yeah. you can undo things and try another thing. Of course, in most games, you and that's, uh, you can do it with, you know, quick save, quick load. And, but it's, yeah, like you said, it's only the player who do that. And, and that's one of the main themes of the game, that if, if I had the power to rewind and to change things, should I do it? Because sometimes it can be really seen as, as, as lying. As if I say a lot of things that you don't like, and if I go back in time and don't say them to try to, so you're not not angry at me. It's it's a bit tricking. So we are really asking those questions. And in the beginning of the game, we are letting the player and Max do it a lot. She's getting to to make a lot of friends with this rewind. But later in the game, and especially in episode five, we are really questioning this to see. Maybe, maybe it wasn't the right thing. Maybe what you did to try to lie to people with your power, was it really good? And that's something that can be interesting for the story, but also to ask the player at, at, at a moment. I think this is a, what we wanted to do also with yeah, this game, so because, to show yeah. that it's difficult to make the choice that's and the it's even have. more difficult to live with it, but you have to learn that to do still that. Have to, and even if you could hesitate a lot, there is no perfect way to do things. Okay, if I'm crazy, Anybody? I might as well go all the way. You were can I actually reverse time? So, and so that's basically that the first time you will, the player will actively rewind. So, so we have to, we have Max thinking that, okay, I just got, got back in time. I mean, this, uh, the art class. Uh, and so that's why, that's why we made a break of camera because we needed to have an element that the player will, will see that we will rewind. So we, we can really explain how do you rewind. So Max broke her camera and then she's thinking, 
okay, if I, get, if I got back in time, maybe I can try to do it again and, and, and revert that. So that's the first real rewind the player is actively doing. We, it's okay, we, we don't really want the, the players to use the rewind all the time. But since um, it's important in the beginning of the game to really show to the, to really show the players the tools he, he have, and it was important for us to have this in this scene, to have a, use, a lot of use of the rewind, so he can really, okay, I know how it is now, and now I decide if I use it or not. I hope I have enough time to get to the bathroom. Please, please. I can't tell anybody. They'll think I'm crazy. Since we are really playing the game with the point of view of Max, for her, not everything is clear, so it shouldn't be clear for the player. So, but there is a lot of hints that should really guide the players to understand what's happening. We have a lot of uh, um, symbolism with an tot totem spirit animals. We have the doe, and you can clearly see in episode four that the doe is, is linked to, to Rachel, and it's basically some, somehow a presence of Rachel that's guiding, guiding, guiding Max at, at moments. I'm not sure that a lot of players notice that, but in episode two, actually, when you see the, the doe in, in the junkyard, it's precisely where, yeah. where Rachel is buried. There is this mystic feeling around the town, and since we didn't want to, to clearly explain everything, it, it's, it's part of what makes Arcadia Bay a bit, a bit different and a bit special.